This is a short video about the some applications of the completeness, or another word for it is the suprema property of the real numbers. So um, recall the following uh, for a, a non-empty subset of the real line. So uh, the first thing, if s is bounded above, then a number u that's a real number is called the supremum, in other words, the least upper bound of s, if both of the following happen. So number one, every element of s should be at most u. And number two, if v is another upper bound of s, then this least upper bound, then u needs to be less than or equal to v. So again, u needs to be the least upper bound, which is what this says. So u should be smaller than any other upper bound is what number two is trying to say. Similarly, if s is bounded below, then a number w is the infimum of the set s. Another word for infimum was the greatest lower bound uh, if both of the following happen. So every element of s has to be bigger than or equal to w. And if t is another lower bound, then t needs to be uh, smaller than or equal to w. And again, that's emphasizing that the infimum is the biggest, the greatest of the lower bounds. It's bigger than any other lower bound. So some applications of this. Um, so one would be if you had a real number a and you had a non-empty set s, you could define a new set that's called a plus s, and it's kind of what it sounds like. I'll just add a to each individual element of s. That's a great new set. So the point though is, if the supremum of s that you started with exists, then you could tell me the supremum of this set as well. It should just be a plus that supremum, the supremum of s itself. So the supremum of the set a plus s should be a plus the supremum of s. So this is kind of maybe some arithmetic stuff that we could do. So how would you prove such a thing? So this is a good exercise to get you um, in the mindset for how do you use one and two? How do you show something's a supremum? So for just for ease of notation, let's say use the supremum of the set S. So a typical element of the set A plus S looks like A plus S, where S is just some element of S. Okay, and so by definition, well, S should be smaller than or equal to U since you use the supremum of S for every S and S. And so therefore, what if I add a to both sides of this inequality? That tells me that a plus s is definitely less than or equal to a plus u for every s and s. So what did that just show? That just showed, number one here, um, our supposed supremum is definitely bigger than or equal to each element of our set, where, again, we're applying this to the set a plus s now. So if we were to do number two now, suppose v is another upper bound for a plus s, what does that mean then? That means that V is greater than or equal to A plus S for every one of these elements A plus S in our set. Well, in particular, like how are these elements different, right? They just differ for, their A plus S depends on, you know, what S from S that you're, you're using. That was confusing. <laughs> what little S from big S that you have. So what we'll try to do, maybe what I'll do is I'll take this A and I'll move it over to this side. So equivalently, S is less than or equal to V minus A for every single element S of your set S. So what does this mean for every single s? Well, that says that v minus a is an upper bound for s. But wait a minute, you know that u is the least upper bound for s. So how should this upper bound v minus a compare to the least upper bound for s? It should be smaller than or equal to. So u should be less than or equal to v minus a. Again, since u is the least upper bound for big s. So finally, what you could do is you could add a back to this other side, because again, what are you going for? You wanna show that uh, a plus u is less than or equal to v, and that's what we get in the next line. So u plus a is less than or equal to v. Again, u plus a is the least of the upper bounds for the set little a plus big s. And so that would be how you show, again, in this case, if you know that the supremum of s is u, then the supremum of this new set, a plus s, is a plus u. Um, some more things that we need to talk about, remember about functions, some of the notation. We won't write it this way, where d is the domain, and uh, what the arrow points to, that's where like your outputs are, is one way to think about it. But I'm not saying that every single thing over here is an output of f, so we're going to call this in general the codomain of f. Now if you're talking about the outputs, that's what we'll call the range. So the range we might denote by f of d, where d is that set, your domain. And so what is this set though? It's the set of all f of x, where x lives in d. So we need to be comfortable with that kind of basic stuff about functions and function notation. And again, the range is a subset of the codomain. Um, so let's, so, oh, some definitions. So we'd say that the function is bounded above if the range, if the set f of d is bounded above. And what did that mean again? That means there exists some real number such that every element of f of d, which looks like f of x, is less than or equal than that number for every single x in there. 
Similarly, we'll say that the function f is bounded below. Oh, I got ahead of myself. There's a picture of maybe what a function looks like if it's bounded below. So I tried to draw you D is the green, that's the domain, those are your X values. The range would be an orange, those are the Y values that you get. And I drew you the graph of that thing, but then I'm saying if you can find a number B that's larger than or equal to every output, then that means that your function is bounded above. So this function's definitely bounded above. Uh, number two, we'll say F's bounded below if the range, the set F of D, uh, is bounded below. And so what did that mean? That means there exists some real number, I'll use b again, where this time b is less than or equal to every single output of your function. So if I was to draw you a picture of that, I'm just gonna use the same picture, but just draw my b in a different spot. You see that every output, every value of the range is definitely above this value b here. So that picture says this inequality right here. And last, we'll say f is bounded if it's both bounded above and below. So it's gotta be both. And I'll use the same picture. Oh, maybe one more way I could say that. If it's both of those, um, one way we might write that is the absolute value of all your outputs are smaller than or equal to some positive number b. And so if I was to draw you that picture here, again, this absolute value thing here, it's trying to say that your, your outputs should fit between this window here and here. I hope that that makes sense when I say that that way. How we, what, we, what might we do with this to, again, tie it back into some stuff with supremums and whatnot. So if you have two bounded functions, f and g, on some domain, and let's say that f of x is always less than or equal to g of x. So one way to think about that, the graph of g is always higher than the graph of f over this domain d. Well, then the supremum of the f's is less than or equal to the supremum of the outputs of g. So, uh, by the way, this new notation, it looks a little bit new, supremum of f of x over all x and d, that's the same thing as the supremum of the set f of d. So we're just saying that the supremum of f of d is less than or equal to the supremum of g of d. So how would you sow such a thing? So how do you prove it? Well, by definition, right, the supremum of g of x for all x and d, that's an upper bound for the set g of d. So that means that g of x is less than or equal to that supremum for every x and d. And so now what do we do? Well, I know how g of x relates to f of x. That's by hypothesis up here. We suppose that f of x is less than or equal to g of x here. So why don't I just stick that on this side of my inequality over here? So I hope you see where that comes from. And so what does that mean then? How do we interpret that? Well, this says that the supremum of g of x is an upper bound for the values of f of x. Well, if the supremum of g of x is an upper bound for the set f of d, again, that's what I mean there, what do I know then? I know that the least upper bound of f of d is the supremum of f over d. That's the least upper bound. So now, how do I get a comparison? Well, here's another upper bound for f of d. Well, this is supposed to be the smallest upper bound for f of d. Therefore, we get the inequality that we're after. The supremum of f over d should be less than or equal to the supremum of g over d. All right, so the next section I want to tell you about quickly here is the Archimedean property. And what does it say? If x is a real number, then there exists a natural number. The subscript here is supposed to mean that perhaps this natural number depends on what this x is. So it's just notation to say, maybe you need a different natural number depending on what x is, but such that though, that x should be less than or equal to that natural number n sub x. Just to draw you a picture, I'm saying that if you picked out any x on a number line, you should be able to find a natural number to the right of it. Pretty believable. Now, what are we gonna do? We're gonna twist that around in some different ways. So a corollary of that, if you have any positive number t, then there exists a natural number, which maybe depends on t, is all that subscript means there, such that though, one over that natural number should fit between zero and t. So in other words, if you're on the real line and you were to plot zero and t, what I'm trying to say is you should be able to always find a natural number whose reciprocal fits between zero and t. I don't care what t is or how tiny it is, we can always find a natural number large enough so that its reciprocal is closer to zero. And so what are some other uh, useful things about the supremum property? Um, one thing that you could do, which I won't go too much into because the details are a little bit, uh, it's a long thing to do, but the supremum property, you could use it to show that 
x squared equals 2 has a solution, that there's a real number x such that x squared is equal to 2. And what that x actually is, is it's the supremum of this set of all real numbers that are positive and whose square is less than or equal to 2. What else could you do with the supremum property? You could show that the rationals are dense in R. And what does this dense word mean? So dense means that if you're given any two real numbers, you should be able to find a rational number between them. So in other words, if I'm given any two real numbers, x and y, like I am here on a number line, you should be able to find a rational number, which has the form p over q for two integers p and q. There should be a rational number that fits between there. And so it doesn't matter how close x and y are to each other, there always exists a rational number between them. In fact, there are infinitely many. Similarly, the irrational numbers are dense in the reals as well. So in other words, again, if you had x and y on a number line, I don't care how close they are, you should always be able to find some irrational number, let's call it z, that fits in there between them as well.